Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةِ لِلْعَالَمِينَ that we did not send you, O Muhammad, except as a mercy unto all the worlds, that the, the Prophet وسلم, is the greatest uh, manifestation of the compassion, the rahmah, of the indiscriminately compassionate ar-Rahman. It is our master Muhammad وسلم, The Prophet وسلم, he said in a hadith, and there's some weakness in the Senate of the hadith, but our ulama quoted a sound in its meaning. With the Prophet ﷺ, he said, "Adabani Rabbi fa'ahsan ta'adibi," that my Lord has uh, disciplined me, trained me, educated me, and how how excellent is my education? That the the Prophet's tarbiya is Rabbaniya. He has a lordly upbringing. <clears throat> so just as uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the most the most compassionate and the most forgiving, uh, He has trained and disciplined and commanded his messenger وسلم, to be a paragon of compassion and forgiveness, to reflect those divine attributes at the level of a human being. Thus the Prophet وسلم, is the Abdullah par excellence, a perfect uh, servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a uniquely sanctified human agent of the divine. Compassion and forgiveness are core virtues in the broader what's known as the uh, Abrahamic tradition. It is reported that uh, David, peace be upon him, said in the Psalms, Psalm 145 verse 9 in the Hebrew language, he said, Tov Adonai Lekol, that the Lord is good to all. And that his mercy or compassion, his rahma, is over all of his actions. Or to put it Quranically, rahmati wasi'at kulla shay, that my mercy encompasses everything. In Matthew chapter nine, Isa alayhi salam is reported to have said, speaking to the Pharisees, he says to them, "Go and learn what this text means." And then he actually quotes from the written Torah, and this is very interesting because Allah subhanahu wa taala tells us in the Quran that Isa alayhi salam said, "Musaddiq li ma bayna yadiya min Torah," that he confirms. Uh, the Torah. So he says, Ki chesed Elohim I require mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. And this is interesting because according to Christianity, at least Trinitarian Christianity, God himself sacrificed himself for our sins uh, by performing this act of self-immolation or vicarious atonement. Now, this is not the teaching of Isa alayhi salam, even according to Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus quotes from the Old Testament, and certainly this is not the teaching of the Old Testament, that I require mercy, mercy, rahmah, not sacrifice. God requires mercy, and he has inscribed upon he has inscribed mercy upon his own self. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. So the Prophet ﷺ being that human reflection of the names and, and names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at a human level, he says, Ana Nabi Rahma, I am the Prophet of mercy. Ana Rahmatun Ana Rahmatun Muhda, I am a gifted mercy. He said وسلم, in a hadith of Musnad Ahmad, Irhamu man fir ard irhamukum or yarhamkum man fis sama. Show compassion and mercy to those on the earth and the one in heaven in no anthropomorphic sense will show you mercy. With respect to forgiveness, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the famous Hadith Qudsi, which is related by Imam al-Tirmidhi, where he says, Ya ibn Adam, O child of Adam, innaka ma da'awtani wa rajawtani ghafartu lak ala ma kana mink wa la ubali. Beautiful Hadith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking upon the tongue of our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the first person, but not Quran, hadith Qudsi, a, a sacred hadith uh, where he says, O oh, child of Adam, as long as you have hope in me and call upon me, I will forgive you, wala ubali, and I don't mind. I don't mind forgiving you. In a tradition related by Ibn Hibban, we are told that at the Battle of Badr, during the actual battle, sorry, the Battle of Uhud, during the actual Ghazwat Uhud, when there was blood streaming down the face of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he raised his hands and he said, Allahumma ighfir li qawmi fa'innahum la ya'lamun. Oh my Lord, forgive me. Oh my Lord, forgive them. Forgive my people, for they don't know. 
for they don't know. This was during the battlefield when people are trying to kill him. There's something similar attributed, by the way, to Isa alayhi salam in the New Testament, uh, the Gospel of Luke 23, 34, where Jesus forgives, his Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Did you know that this statement attributed to Isa alayhi salam in the Gospel of Luke is universally recognized as a fabrication to the Gospel of Luke by almost all New Testament uh, critics? But what is more authentic is that the Prophet ﷺ, when he came into Mecca, right, and he's fully within his rights to extract vengeance, what did he say? Quoting Yusuf ﷺ from the Quran, لا تفريب عليكم اليوم يغفر الله لكم There is no blemish on you today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven you. One of my favorite hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, a hadith that gives me a lot of hope, is related by Imam an nawawi when the Prophet ﷺ was in the masjid after the congregational prayer and a man came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, I have breached the boundaries of the permissibility, of the permissible according to the Qur'an, فَأَقِمْ فِيَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ so, so, so punish me or bring the judgment down upon me according to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet ﷺ asked him a very surprising question. He said, Hal, ha, didn't you just pray with us just now? And the man said, Naam. And the Prophet said, قَدْ غُفِرَ لَكْ Or, إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ غَفَرَ لَكْ ذَنْبَكْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already forgiven uh, your sin. SubhanAllah. Of course, there's this another episode that's attributed to Isa alayhi salam in John chapter 8, what's called the Pericope Adulteri, which you'll find in every single Jesus movie ever made, that a woman who is caught in the act of adultery is being chased by these Pharisees who want to stone her, and then she falls down at the feet of Jesus. And of course, he makes that famous statement, speaking to the Pharisees, uh, wh whomever among you is without sin, cast the first stone. This, this passage which is in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 12, is universally recognized as a fabrication for the text of the Gospel of John. It is not found in any of the uh, most earliest and best Alexandrian textual type New Testament Greek manuscripts. It is a fabrication to the text almost by ijma of New Testament textual critics. So it's very strange. Oftentimes we hear about Islam being a very sort of rigid, tit for tat, sort of uh, 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 eye for an eye re religion, whereas Christianity is about forgiveness and, and mercy. And it is about forgiveness and mercy. Those are core attributes, core virtues in Christianity. But don't forget that these are also core ideas in our tradition uh, as well. That the Prophet wasallam, he at times seemed to prioritize compassion and forgiveness over justice. Now, justice is a great virtue, right? It is the basis Adala, according to Imam al-Qurtubi, is the, is the basis of our sharia. Justice creates uh, social well-being, peaceful coexistence. There must be justice in a society. Even Plato uh, uh, identified dikayo sune, which is difficult to translate as justice or righteousness, that this is the core, the, the, the foundational attribute of, 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 the, of the republic, of a city that operates in a correct, virtuous way. So there must be justice. However, compassion and forgiveness are also great virtues. Now, none of us have compassion and forgiveness in the absolute and perfect sense. That is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the same goes for justice, right? The same goes for justice. Absolute and perfect justice cannot manifest in this world. This is our belief, you know, and sometimes I have to burst the bubbles of some of our younger people that it's just not going to happen. It's not the nature of the dunya to produce absolute justice and to obsess in its pursuance is an exercise in futility. Now, yes, we must do our absolute best to be just as much as we can according to our principles. But ultimately, ultimately, we will fall short of perfection and we have to recognize this. Earthly systems, human interpretations, can never be perfect. We are not meant to be too comfortable in the dunya. And this is the secret to understanding what it means to be in the world and not of the world. Or as the Prophet ﷺ said, Kun fi dunya ka gharib, abidu sabilin, kama qala wasalam, Be in the dunya like a stranger or one who was passing, passing through, passing by. Only ala adil, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be absolutely just. The state or some polity cannot replicate or replace God. 
And to think that it can is just beyond terrifying and intimates really a crisis of faith. They tried to do that. It's called Maoism. It was called Stalinism, fascism. This is why we, we believe in something called Yom al qiyamah the Day of Judgment, right? Yom al Avim, uh, Yom Hisab, Yom Avim, a great day. Yom Ayakumun Nasu li Rabbil Alameen, when everyone will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And guess what? On that day, we won't want justice. We will want compassion. And it's our hope in Allah's compassion that gives us peace. It's our hope in Allah's compassion that gives us peace. No compassion, no peace. That's going to be the sentiment on the Yom Al-Qiyamah. No one's going to be saying, no justice, no peace on the Yom Al-Qiyamah. No compassion, no peace. And it's a true peace, a lasting peace. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا you have in the Messenger of God وسلم, a beautiful pattern of conduct. For whoever has raja, hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This isn't some kind of blind hope with no work behind it. That's called tamanni. This is someone who ties their camel and puts their tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For whoever has hope, good hope, with work, with, with effort, with practice, Hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the final day and makes remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with abundance. In college, you may have studied someone, you may have studied someone called Friedrich Nietzsche who actually said that compassion was a vice and an indication of what he called a slave or herd mentality. And he advocated for what's known as a transvaluation of all values, essentially a rethinking of all values. You know, and what he meant by that was really Christian values. But we have those val many of those values in common with Christians. We share those values. And some might say, well, Nietzsche was a bit of a visionary. He actually foresaw the type of nihilism that would result in a society due to what he called the death of God, or sort of this idea that uh, there is no God. Uh, and, you know, that's true. He was somewhat of a visionary. But it's very ironic that this man's final sane act before he completely lost his mind, people don't read his biography. He was walking in the streets of Turin, Italy, and he saw a man beating his horse. And he ran and he, he grabbed the horse, he hugged the horse, and he was weeping. His final sane act before he lost his mind completely, he never spoke again after this, was an act of compassion towards an animal. We see the greatness of this and the hypocrisy of these, of these weird philosophies that are speaking out against being a compassionate person. Now, what we cannot do is align ourselves with certain people uh, who represent certain groups who are fundamentally opposed to our non-negotiable metaphysical and moral commitments. And various Muslims do this for various reasons. Probably the biggest reason is this kind of shared perception of victimization, what's known in the academy as intersectionality, or it's out of a need to uh, assimilate into postmodern, uh, quote unquote, uh, progressivism in the academy, which is really due to a lack of knowledge of or lack of confidence in our own tradition. So they align themselves with people who maintain these very strange beliefs. People who maintain, for example, that all traditional value systems are inherently oppressive, especially the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition. People who have declared basically ideological warfare on the tradition of Ibrahim alayhi salam, on Abrahamic religions, Abrahamic morality, people who believe that there's no objective truth or morality, which is in and of itself a contradiction, but contradictions don't seem to bother these people. People who maintain that there's nothing normative, they hate that word normative or normal or orthodox, they hate these types of words. Why is this a problem? Because eventually they will expect us to compromise our morals, our ethics, and our theological beliefs, the very ethos of our religions, of our religion, in hopes of, of conjuring up um, uh, into existence some sort of radically egalitarian and just utopia according to their subjective definitions of justice, morality, and right and wrong. You see, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, there will come a time upon the people, 
Nothing will remain except Al-Islam, except its name. It's going to become a name without a reality. This indicates that Islam, that, that Islam, that there is a norm, quote-unquote normative definition of Islam. It is not defined by our feelings. You see, in the, in the pre-modern world, the haq, the truth, was known by naql and aql, by revelation and reason. That's how, you know, that's how you know the truth. That was their epistemology, right? Or nurun ala nur, light upon light, which is, which is how many of the exegetes of the Qur'an interpret that statement, nurun ala nur, in ayatun nur, naql working in conjunction, in conjunction with aql. Now, uh, I'm not romanticizing the pre-modern world. Obviously, there's societal and political issues. But what I'm talking about is on an epistemic level. They got it right. Naql and aql. Now we move into the modern the modern world. Well, our naql is thrown out of the window. Everything becomes intellect. In fact, everything really becomes a type of strict empiricism. Where if you can't see it or taste it or touch it, then it doesn't exist. This kind of mechanistic science, this kind of Newtonian physics this idea of total materialism, so everything becomes uh, the uh, empiricism and everything becomes intellect. That's how you know everything. And then we move into the postmodern period where both knuckle and akal are thrown out of the window, right? Revelation, oh, that's, you know, this antiquated, divisive uh, tool of oppression. And then the akal, you can't really trust your intellect. So what is their epistemology? How do you know the reality? Well, it's based on your feelings, whatever you want it to be. So now reality is defined by the zeitgeist, no matter how antithetical it might be to the authentic teachings of our Prophet You see, we can't go there. We have certain theological and ethical thawabit, immutables, non-negotiables, underlying principles, however you want to call it. Islam is not defined by our feelings. It is defined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Quran, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He could have made us into one people. We're all like-minded, but He didn't do that. So we have to be principled. We can't be sellouts. قُلِ الْحَقُ وَإِن كَانَ مُرًّا وَلَا تَخَفِّ اللَّهِ لَوْمَ تَلَائِمْ the Prophet ﷺ gave advice to his Sahaba, speak the truth even if it's bitter, and don't fear the reproaches of those who find fault in your religion. We're not trying to please these people. We're trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, uh, morality is not subjective. And truth is real and falsehood is real. And this is our deen. We should stick up for it. And if people disagree with us, that's fine. Just say, lakum dina kum deen. This is from the Quran. What's more tolerant than that? You have your religion, I have my religion. You have your ideas and philosophies, I have my ideas. You have your ideas of nature and nurture, and I have my ideas of nature and nurture. You have your ideas of what is virtuous and what is not, and so do I. لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ مَلِيَ الدِّينَ فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَالْيُؤْمِنْ فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَالْيَكْفُرْ Whoever wants to believe, let him believe. Whoever doesn't want to believe, let him disbelieve. I used to teach at a college that was predominantly a Catholic, and I used to tell my Christian students who would come into my office hours, a Muslim professor, because they were being berated by these professors spouting this type of postmodern nonsense. They would come into my office, and they would they would sit there and they would cry, and I would give them advice and say, believe in God, persevere in God. This is why I would tell them. I would quote their own scripture back to them. <laughs> I would quote their own scripture back to them, where Jesus says to the disciples, if, if, if the world hates you, remember it hated me first, right? That people who are egocentric, people who put themselves in the, in the center of the universe, people who are geocentric, I'm not talking about, you know, cosmological geocentrism. I'm talking about people who put the dunya in the center of their lives, of their priorities. The people that are theocentric, right? The, the former tend to hate the latter. People who put themselves and the world in the center of their lives tend to hate and despise and mock and ridicule the theocentric people, the people who put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the center of their lives. Or as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, give, give Allah victory so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you victory. This is, if, and if this is our position, right, if we take our stand and stand firm, then we will notice that decent non-Muslim people, especially people that fear and love God, people who practice traditional morality and understand the power of compassion and forgiveness and are not 
constantly screaming justice, 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 which is really coming from a place of hurtbar dunya, then they will respect our differences. They will advocate for peaceful coexistence, and they will simply agree to disagree. But with the postmodern types, right, the moral relativists, the critical theorists, some of these nominalists, the philosophical materialists, the social constructionists, when it comes to them, they will not agree to disagree with us. What you will eventually hear from them is if you don't agree with me, and if you don't radically reform your archaic religious beliefs, then eventually they'll, they'll say to you, then you are a bigot, you are a transphobe, a homophobe, you're a misogynist, they might call you a fat phobe, right? Uh, you're just a caveman, and you're a purveyor of toxic patriarchy. And you know what? There's no room for you in our little utopia on earth. By the way, the word utopia means non-place. That's what the word literally means. A no place is not going to happen. It's in the word itself. And my response to those types of people is, that's great. Hasbun Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sufficient for us. So don't sell out. It's not worth it. Have istiqama. Life is too short to be a sellout. Right? A man came to the Prophet وسلم, he said, Ya Rasulullah, qul li fil islami qawlan la as'alu anhu ahadan ghayrak. Tell me something about Islam that only you can tell me. Give me something special from you. The Prophet said, very, very quick answer, but very profound. He has this gift, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, communicating profound truths with a few words. Qul amantu billah. Say, I believe in God. Fumastaqim. And be upright and be steadfast upon that. Don't be wishy-washy. Seek a place with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Seek a place with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not in the hearts of men. The Prophet sallallahu is the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, If you were to follow their vain desires, now that after knowledge of the truth has come to you, then you will find neither helper nor protector against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And don't forget, that the salient point is due to the generality of the expression, not due to the specificity of its occasion of revelation. This is an axiom in Quranic exegesis. In other words, this threat or wa'id, essentially what it is, is also for us, is for every single Muslim, that if we follow their vain desires, now that after the knowledge of the truth has come to us, then we will find neither helper nor protector against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To paraphrase a brilliant man, if we're going to constantly complain about other people and how bad we have it, we better make sure that the evil is truly out there, outside of ourselves, and not in here, not in our own hearts. The Prophet sallallahu he said, Whenever you want to mention the faults of others, remember your own faults. Whoever humbles himself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will exalt. Whoever exalts himself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will debase and humiliate. This is totally lost on a lot of modern people. Humility, you know, being grateful, Remember, inequality does not always mean inequity. Just because there's inequality in the world, which is the nature of the world. That's the nature of the world. High and low, ebb and flow. It doesn't mean that they're always victims of that inequality. It does not always denote injustice. Some people are simply more intelligent than others. Some people have more wealth than others. Some people are better looking. Now, there are victims in the world. That's true. Definitely they are, right? But what we tend to do is self-victimize. We feel like someone owes us something. And really the cure for that is self-criticism and gratitude. Shukur. Shukur is a beautiful, beautiful theological virtue in our tradition. And it's all over the Quran. In Semitic rhetoric, there's something called binarity. This is when antithetical ideas or concepts are juxtaposed for some sort of rhetorical effect. For example, فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ وَشْكُرُونِي وَلَا تَكْفُرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
He says, be grateful to me. Uh, he says, have regard for me so that I might have regard for you. Uh, uh, be grateful and do not disbelieve. Have shukur and don't be people of kufur. Very, very interesting. So shukur and kufur are juxtaposed, right? They are antonyms. In other words, ingratitude, ingratitude is a type of disbelief. In other words, the word for ingratitude in the Quran is kufur. So we have to be very, very careful and check ourselves, right? There was a certain king, I, and this is one of my favorite parables. One of my teachers told me many, many years ago, I say it a lot. There was a certain king in a certain kingdom who had everything he ever wanted except he didn't have gratitude. So he was discontent. So what he used to do is he used to walk around the forest behind his castle and just contemplate. And he was in sort of in, a, in you know in this depressed mood. And then he saw this pauper, a poor man, sitting beneath a tree. And this poor man had a glass of water. He had a crust of bread. He had clothes that barely covered his aura. And he was making dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with great joy. And so the king approached the man and he said, Look, you're a, you're a poor man. Why are you so happy? Why do you rejoice? And the man said, uh, Why shouldn't I be? Right? I have everything I need. And he said, what do you have? He said, I have everything I need. And this man, this pauper, he was an Arif Billah. Right? And so he actually recognized that this was the king. And he said to him, you're the king. Why aren't you happy? You have everything you want. And the king said, I don't know. So the pauper said to the man, if you were lost in the desert, if you were lost in the desert, and you were going to die of thirst, a horrible death, how much of your kingdom would you give for half a glass of water? And the king said, half of my kingdom. And then the pauper said to the king, he said, if you drank that water and you were unable to excrete it out of your body and it was going to cause an infection and kill you, how much of your kingdom would you give for the ability to get rid of that water? He said, the other half of my kingdom. So the pauper said, your entire kingdom was worth a glass of water. I have that here. I have a crust of bread. I have clothes that cover my aura. I have the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have that and more. You see, this parable is obviously meant to be hyperbolic, but we get the point. Just be grateful, be content, be in a state of taslim to the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Continuous ingratitude and an obsession for earthly justice is upstream to discontentment with Allah's qadr. And that is dangerous, right? And a lot of young college students that I come into contact with that have a lot of zeal for this. I tell them all the time, that's fine. Work for justice. But just remember, you're not Aquaman. You're not Wonder Woman. This is not the Justice League. Nietzsche's Ubermensch or Superman is motivated by a love of this world and a rejection of the next world. While the Prophet وسلم, who is the true Superman, he said, Love of the world is the head of every sin. Just do your best and say, Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. Right? And just contemplate the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ فَأَسْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانَ You became brethren by means of Allah's ni'mah. And some of the ulama here, they say, this ni'mah is a, is a direct reference to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That he put love between your hearts by means of his ni'mah and you became brethren. The Prophet وسلم, is Khayr al Khalqillah, he is Sayyidu Waladi Adam. This fact by itself should engender a type of gratitude in the heart that should last you until the end of your days. What are we complaining about, really, when you think about it? I can't even go to interfaith dialogues anymore. I used to do these all the time for 20 years. Now they've become exhibitions of ingratitude. Just like these pity parties where there's no real knowledge being communicated, a lot of anecdotal evidence. Right, people just complaining. Right, I went to one. Uh, the last one I went to, somebody got Muslim stood up and said, "20 years ago, I was in a grocery store and somebody made a racist comment." Don't get me wrong, that's horrible. Racism is horrible. That's obvious. It's axiomatic. But is this something really to complain about and bring up in an interfaith dialogue? You know, the Prophet sallallahu he heard worse than that to his own face in Medina. I'm not talking about Mecca. In his own city, where he's the head of state, where the buck stopped at him, a group of people walked by him. Assalamu alaikum, death be upon you. This was in Medina. Why do we expect better circumstances 
in America in 2020. How can it be better than Medina to Munawwara, the time of the Prophet Right? And sometimes people do threaten our lives. Sometimes people do make threats. And obviously that's horrible. And those are, those are obviously things that we should take very, very seriously. But put things in perspective. What are we complaining about? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not pity his Prophet. He sent him suwar of tasliyah, of comfort and consolation to strengthen and encourage him. When the Prophet was, was abused in Ta'if and kicked out of the city, and he collapsed under the tree. He said, Allahumma inni ashku ilayka da'afa quwwati. I complain to you because of my lack of strength. He attributed what had happened to him due to his own weakness. This is from his tawadur. Right? This is our role model, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. We complain so much, Allah gave us all something to complain about. Look at us now. But even now, we shouldn't complain. This is not a time for complaint. Exactly the opposite. It, because this could be a thousand times worse when you think about it. This could be a thousand times worse what, what, what we're going through right now. This is a time where we should look inward and repent and correct our conduct. The Prophet ﷺ was a victim of verbal and physical abuse in Mecca. But how did he handle that? This is very important. Now, some of the ulama divide the Prophet's life into what's known as Isawi or Christic and Musawi, a mosaic periods. In other words, Mecca and Medina. In other words, in Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ, he practiced something called assertive nonviolence. Martin Luther King said that Isa ﷺ practiced assertive nonviolence. This should be our practice. What is assertive nonviolence? It is, it is to be totally nonviolent, to be filled with compassion and mercy, yet to be principled, virtuous, and devout. Right? If you just read the New Testament, Matthew 23, Jesus, peace be upon him, in, in his life, uh, uh, he was nonviolent, right? He didn't pick up the sword. He was not in a position of power at any time during his life. He said, if, if my kingdom were of this world, my disciples would have fought, but, it, but my kingdom is not from here, at least not this time around, right? Yet he spoke the truth. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You've overlooked the weightier demands of the law, justice, mercy, and good faith. You strain at the gnat and you swallow the camel. How can you escape the punishment of hell? Hypocrites, brood, vipers. This is quoting from Matthew chapter 23. Right? To, be, to be totally nonviolent, yet principled, virtuous, and devout. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet وسلم, after he was attacked in one of the streets and they threw something on him, Ya ayyuhal mudathir, oh you wrapped in a mantle, qum fa'anthir, on your feet, get up. And warn the people, you have a job to do. What is Allah essentially telling the Prophet ﷺ? Essentially telling him to continue to be compassionate to them in the, <clears throat> in the face of their abuse to you. Because the Prophet's vocation is as a bashir and a nadir. A nadir, a warner. When someone warns you of something, essentially they're being compassionate to you. To you. If someone sees, a, if someone sees a, a car about to plow into your house or something, or a tornado about to take and destroy your house, and this person doesn't warn you, that's, that's an act of, of cruelty. But if he warns you, that's an act of rahmah, mercy. And stay positive, magnify your Lord. You have a rub, don't forget that. The rub denotes the imminent deity, the personal deity, the God who loves you and takes care of you. Trust Him. And keep your clothes clean. They did it to you, but you are going to clean it. Work on yourself first. Don't lay down on the ground and say, well, this person knocked me down. He has to pick me back up. Well, I'm not going to pick myself back up. No. Get up. Dust yourself off and get to work. Right? Get back out there and show them compassion. This is very, very difficult. And shun their idolatry, their immorality. Be principled. Don't be a sellout. And don't think that they, that they owe you anything. And be hopeful and optimistic. Don't be rash or impetuous. I'm out of time, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan.